Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we're gonna get started. Um, today's webinar presenter is Dr. Peter Lilienthal, Global Microgrid Lead at UL and the founder of Homer Energy. I'm Marilyn Walker, the co-founder of Homer Energy, and I'm gonna be the host today. Dr. Lilienthal is uniquely qualified to talk about today's topic, which, and, and today, actually, this webinar, I'm so excited. We have a record number of participants here. Um, so I, I'm, we're really um, glad to, to offer this to you. So Dr. Lilienthal, Peter, received a PhD in Management Science and Engineering from Stanford University and joined the Solar Energy Research Institute here in Colorado in 1990. And uh, that later became the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or, or NREL, shortly thereafter. Peter went on to become a senior economist at NREL, and that's where he created Homer. He founded Homer Energy about 11 years ago here in Colorado. So before we begin, I do want to talk quickly about Homer, the software product that has been such a key piece of making this microgrid market possible. HOMER is an acronym for Hybrid Optimization of Multiple Energy Resources. And the HOMER approach includes three different processes nested together. At its core, HOMER is a simulation engine. It simulates the operation of an electric power system for one year, hour by hour or minute by minute. And that at each time step, HOMER looks for the most cost-effective way to meet the electric load based on the set of constraints that the user defines. Simulation tells you how one system operates, and then an optimization step simulates hundreds of different systems to find the least cost system. Homer also has an option to do sensitivity analyses, which allow you to look at the impact changes in variables you don't have control over, such as fuel price or wind speed, have on your system design and system costs. Using Homer to design and optimize your microgrid or distributed hybrid energy system has three main steps. First, you provide information on the economics, such as the interest rate, along with your energy demand profiles, your location, which is gonna tell us the renewable resources available, solar radiation and wind speed, as well as the types of equipment to consider shown here as the system components. Homer then steps through the three nested processes I talked about in the last slide, simulation, optimization, and sensitivity. And then it provides detailed results, not only on the economics of the system, but also on exactly what's going on literally in every hour or even every minute, if that's what you need to know. There are two versions of Homer. Homer Pro, our original product and our flagship, with broad applications for microgrids in many markets. Homer Grid was designed explicitly for behind the meter systems in grid connected markets, where demand charge reduction, time of use rates, maximizing self consumption, incentives, resiliency, reliability, or some combination of these are what matters most. We're still actively developing both these products as markets and technology grow. Um, we're actually only days away from releasing a new version of Homer Grid to address electric vehicle charging. We'll talk more about that at the end of the webinar. So um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Peter for his presentation, the reason you've all come today. So, um... You should see that same slide again. Um, and thank you, Marilyn, for that lead-in, and thank you all for joining. It's a it's a real honor to have this many people uh, uh, joining joining the conversation. So I'm going to uh, give a historical perspective, and it's it's going to be a little personal because it kind of uh, uh, matches my career as well. So I, I hope you don't mind if I'm a little pers uh, give you my personal perspectives on it. Um, but you couldn't wouldn't do a stor uh, historical, historical perspective of microgrids justice without mentioning that the first uh, power system was a microgrid that Thomas Edison built at Pearl Street Station in New York City in 1882. And of course, that was a microgrid at the time. And uh, and then being in Colorado, I have to show the Telluride, which is a 
well, it's now a world-class ski area, but it's a tiny little town in the obscure part of the state. Uh, but it was a, a mining uh, area in the 1800s, and uh, they claim to be the first um, electric utility in the U.S. and the first use of AC. And it's a very picturesque uh, location, so I, it makes a great picture. Uh, but it set the stage for uh, the use of AC broadly, which can be transmitted long distances, et cetera. And there's a great I have to recommend this movie, The Current Wars, which talks about the rivalry between Edison, who was promoting DC, and Westinghouse and Tesla, who were promoting AC. A great movie, just came out fairly recently, um, a Hollywood-type movie. Uh, but it, it gives that history quite accurately. And, and of course, AC won because it could be transmitted long distances. Uh, and then within, within a few years, they built a very large system, Niagara Falls, which still operates today, um, and that's the picture on the lower right. So um, that's just a little historical perspective. It's not actually that relevant because economies of scale ended up killing the microgrid in the early 20th century. And I sort of like this um, mathematical explanation of it. The output of something like a steam boiler is a function of its volume, which is a cube function, but the cost is a function of the surface area, the steel that goes into it. And that's a, uh, a, a function of power of two, a square function. So the cost over the output is a function of the um, power of two thirds, which is less than linear. That's a little math, uh, you know, you have to be a math, a little bit of a mathematician to appreciate that, but, but, and it's an oversimplification. But what it's saying is you double the size of the boiler, the output's gone up eightfold, but the cost's only gone up fourfold. And so the trend throughout the, entire, uh, uh, the whole first half and more of the 20th century was bigger and bigger is better. Uh, and uh, that creates a natural monopoly. And of course, wires running out in the street are, you don't want competing sets of wires. So the, the utilities industry was all about natural monopolies and a regulatory structure to, to support that. Um, <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, there are diseconomies of scale. You know, a, a, as they get bigger, they get more complex. Uh, and there was a great book written in the 70s, Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher. Um, that talked about the need for people scale technology. Uh, and, you know, he used the term decentralized a lot. And in the power industry, he used the word distributed. It's sort of synonymous. Uh, but now we're talking about the six Ds of, of the energy future Dist distributed energy, a diverse, that, 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 uh, that, that gives resilience to the, to the system. Um, if you're going to have that many small systems, you need to communicate. And so the, information and communication technology uh, that uh, uh, are making that possible. So that's the digitalized part. Uh, the huge challenge in the future, uh, actually in the present for the future, is decarbonization. And so that's that's the use of renewables, which are spread, spread out around the world so that they're also decentralized. And I'd like to make a point about this because when you have concentrations of power, and a power plant is nothing but a concentration of power, um, that's thermodynamic power, but it leads to economic power, which leads to political power. Uh, and so this, this movement towards distributed power actually is a democratization as well, which, which we feel is um, really valuable. So, so uh, the first crack in that monopoly wall uh, was the in the U.S. was PERPA, the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act. 1978 also happens to be the year I graduated from college, so that's why it, my um, I just feel it'd be a little personal about this. And in the 1980s, I was helping develop combined heat and power plants because the two things that really were kicked off by PERPA were we called it cogeneration then um, and wind farms. And, but the wind farms aren't really distributed, so. Um, uh, so we focused on combined heat and power in the 80s. In the 90s, I, I joined NREL, but also what happened in the 90s, we created the Village Power Program. It was a response to the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. And uh, how could we help developing countries um, provide access, energy access to um, the billions of people who, who, who lacked it? And at the time, we thought, well, that seems like a perfect uh, application of renewable energy, uh, but it would be a, have to be a hybrid system. What would they look like? How would that work? What's the economics? Um, does wind, at the time, the wind program actually funded it mo the, mostly in the beginning. Um, 
So how does wind compete with solar, compete with biomass, et cetera? Um, and, it, and, and we were way ahead of our times. It, it was a really a research project back then, but NREL is a research organization, so that made sense. Uh, and we did some pilot projects that I'll show in a minute. Um, by the 2000s, the politics had changed. The Village Power Pro Program, we actually um, morphed into a World Bank pro and, and well, not just World Bank, but uh, um, NREL sort of gave it over to international development organizations and it morphed into the Global Village Energy Partnership. Um, and we started focusing on larger systems because we look because um, we realized there were lots of places in the world burning diesel uh, 24 seven. So the, I call it island power in the 2000s. That was sort of the where you started to see a lot more development. Uh, but what, what's really taken off late lately are grid connected microgrids and the buzzword now is resilient. So so that's sort of the grand scheme of things, kind of a, 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 an agenda for the rest of the talk as well. So what were some of the lessons we learned from the early microgrids? Like I mentioned, Village Power Program started in 92. It was also when this uh, one of the first microgrids that I'm aware of uh, was developed on in the Yucatan in Mexico. Uh, and we learned a lot from that. We learned that it's really important to have clear ownership because uh, this project was just sort of donated to the village and nobody was responsible for it. So it, it, it didn't get adequate support. Uh, the, 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 you need to have a management structure in place uh, for it. So it, it, it really wasn't that successful, although later they went in and retrofitted it and the village now has reliable power, et cetera. But another um, lesson was the importance of energy efficiency because we put in this system and the villagers all went out and bought secondhand refrigerators, which are you know really inefficient compared to new modern refrigerators. Uh, and so that overwhelmed the system uh, and it's much more cost effective to spend the money on the energy efficient appliance than to spend the, the money that would be required to power an inefficient appliance. So um, that was a lesson learned. We also, there was no metering. So of course people didn't care about whether it was inefficient or not. So that's in retrospect, that seems pretty obvious that you should have metering there. And local conditions are really important and they vary from place to place. This happened to be a very salty environment because it's right on the ocean and there was corrosion problems. So it wasn't really a successful problem, but you, you learn from your uh, from these things. Um, two years later, also in Mexico, we did another uh, you know fishing village on the coast uh, and it was much more successful, but we still had lessons learned. Uh, in this case, for example, the inverter used as much power just on standby as the solar arrays produced. Uh, now it had wind turbines as well, so it, it did save diesel fuel and it was a, it, 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 it worked. So that was good. Uh, but I, I still identified that well we, the technology really isn't quite mature yet. Um, another uh, early um, project, this was actually 1997, I think. Um, in, in St. Paul, Alaska is, is in the middle of Bering Sea. And um, one of the real problems back then was lead acid batteries just really are inadequate for heavy duty cycling. So the d developer of this project said, we're, we're gonna develop a project with no batteries. And so they put in excess wind, uh, which is fine because they could use the excess energy for heat. And St. Paul, Alaska, is, as you can see in the picture, um, is a pretty cold place. Actually, it's probably the coldest place in the summer uh, it's right in the middle of the of the Bering Sea, and I think the July high temperature is like uh, 47 degrees, which would be like eight degrees Celsius, I think, and that's their high temperature in the summer. So they need heat all year round, and so they could use the excess wind for heating. Um, what's really remarkable about this system is that it runs 100% with wind and load management, no diesel off. For weeks at a time, it's trying to do that for the entire year is 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 problematic. But but they demonstrated that they could have a stable grid, stable frequency, stable voltage, with variable wind, and managing that variability just through load management. So that and that was over 20 years ago. So that's quite an accomplishment. Um, a similar system in another even smaller village, an even much more remote village. So I had to show the map because. This is where man first set foot on North America. Uh, and it's so it's truly remote. And you can see from the picture there. And the picture on the left shows how severe the weather is, if you can see the snow drifts. Um, 
So a lesson learned there, this one did have a, a storage, but it had a tiny bit of storage that used nickel instead of lead. Um, today, they'd use lithium probably. Um, but a high power battery, just 15 minutes, was enough to, uh, it, to uh, be much more aggressive about turning off the diesel because you had a bridge to get it back on again. So um, that was a, a very innovative project. Uh, and again, also used excess wind for heating. Um, I mean, a really important lesson here was the need for remote monitoring, which seems kind of obvious, actually. And if you, if you put a de demonstration project in a remote area, how are you demonstrating something if you don't monitor it? Um, so, th for example, th there was a problem with this system. It was down for like six months, and we didn't know it was down. The villagers just, you know, went back to using diesel all the time. Uh, and so, remote seems obvious remote monitoring is is crucial and these days everybody does it but um back then uh, well you, you learn from these lessons right so then uh, in, in the 2000s like i mentioned um village power lost interest politically in the us uh, and uh, but we morphed into looking at larger systems because um one of the lessons learned is that how many islands there are in the world. There's tens of thousands of inhabited islands that are all burning diesel 24-7. Uh, and so they're paying um, power prices three, four times what people on the mainland would pay, uh, or even more. In, in, in some of the smaller islands, it's it's crazy. They The logistics of getting fuel to some of the smaller islands in the Pacific, for example. Um, so I, just to tell a little story, they, you know, telling me about the way they deliver fuel is they throw 55 gallon drums over the side of a boat and swim them to shore. So that's clearly not a great way to um, provide sustainable power. Uh, so, so these areas are all over the world. Indonesia has thousands, just that one country alone has thousands of inhabited islands, but, uh, um, and they're all different sizes. So with the picture on the lower right is the Maui Brewing Company in Maui, Hawaii. That's about a 100 megawatt system, similar to St. Thomas, Aruba. So those are pretty large systems uh, where renewables are still really cost effective because they're mostly burning liquid fuels. Um, uh, but then, of course, they're tiny islands too. So there's this huge diversity um, and it's a very cost effective market for hybrid renewable systems. There's marketing challenges because they're so they're so scattered around the world, and there's support challenges, um, and it's new technology. And one of the lessons we also learned is that folks that live on islands tend to be conservative about adopting new technology. The um, so uh, they need help. Uh, they, they they're not the um, w on the technical and financial side for the most part. Now there's some islands like Bermuda that are extremely wealthy, but that's sort of unusual. Some of the islands, like in Kiribati, are extremely poor. So it's there's a huge variety of, of needs. Um, and so, so that was what kept us busy in 2000s. But things are changing uh, really fast. Uh, batteries are getting a lot better, uh, mostly motivated by electric vehicles, but also laptops and cell phones have made lithium ba uh, the battery of choice in many ways. Uh, Actually, for for um, these stationary applications, there's other uh, chemistries and flow batteries that are promising and, and maybe a better technical fit. <clears throat> but there's so much development going into lithium batteries for electric vehicles that the scale, the manufacturing scale, is 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 uh, is huge, and and we're sort of piggybacking on that that market. Uh, and and the change, but the change all across the storage. Uh, industry is 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 remarkable and we're and we're in the middle of it it, it, it it's it's uh, i wouldn't say this is mature yet we're seeing we're still seeing huge improvements in battery technology and huge price decreases i mentioned blockchain I won't say i'm really an expert on blockchain but um if you're going to have lots of distributed systems and they're connected grid because the grid connected microgrids are really taking off they need to communicate with each other. They need to know what the system conditions are, what the spot prices are, what the future prices are about whether to charge and discharge batteries. And, um, and so there's a lot of communication required uh, and, and blockchain is maybe one of the ways to make that um, communication feasible. 
the biggest challenge, I believe, is regulatory cha changes because uh, this is going to really change the utility industry. And the regulatory structure was all designed around this concept of a natural monopoly. Uh, and, and regulatory change doesn't happen fast. There's, you have multiple, lots of parties in there arguing with each other. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I believe that's the biggest challenge that we face is can we adapt, can the regulatory structure adapt quickly enough to uh, accommodate the technology that's changing and the needs that society has? So like I said, grid-connected microgrids, uh, we think are, is, the, is the growth area. And, and one of the lessons we learned is that if you go to an, a remote area, whether it's an island or you know remote area in a, in a rural area in a developing country, and you tell them about how great microgrids are, the first thing they'll ask you is, well, do you use them? And if, and if they don't see you using them, they think you're pawning some second-rate technology off on them, which is understandable. I, I actually don't think that's true, but, it, but it's very understandable. Uh, but uh, so, but but now we are looking at using microgrids in the U.S. quite a lot. The motivation is a little bit different. We're not trying to save diesel fuel. Where the motivation is more about resilience. Uh, and what the the real eye opener was Hurricane Sandy when it hit the New York and New Jersey metropolitan area. Suddenly we realized there's a lot more in critical infrastructure. Like it's not just about the hospitals anymore. It's it's also about grocery stores and gas stations and police stations. And the, if the power is gonna be off for an extended period of time, like weeks or, and over a region, diesel backup generators aren't adequate because they don't, you can't store enough fuel. And there are enough fuel trucks to, to refuel that many uh, generators over a large area. And, and the, you know, the roads might be a mess. Uh, so if you, if you want resilience, you can't rely on the transmit the, the power system uh, because that's pretty vulnerable. The, the picture in the middle there is an ice storm in Quebec. Um, I, I really like that picture. <laughs> um, uh, no, if you want a resilient power system, the power has to be produced where it's used. If, uh, um, and so that's where microgrids really, really uh, come to the fore. Uh, and the most recent example are the wildfires in Australia and in California. And in California, you know, the, the largest utility in California declared bankruptcy because they're getting sued because a lot of the wildfires were, were caused by um, the transmission system. So they're shutting down the transmission system anytime it's really windy and dry to, to try to prevent wildfires. But that means all people quite large numbers of people are without power for several days at a time. And so all the, all those, not just the people in their homes, but also the businesses and the, like you mentioned, the critical infrastructure, they all need microgrids because they're gonna, they're, the, the power is gonna be intentionally shut off to prevent these wildfires. So the leaders here were the military because the resilience and, and uh, um, um, readiness is such an, in, so important to them. Uh, and if there's a terrorist attack, they 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 can't just go home. They're they're um, so, uh, but also campuses because it's it's just simpler you know, when you have one uh, owner with multiple buildings. Campus is sort of a logical place to do it. Um, but but now they're uh, like especially in California now they're they're of interest uh, for any anyone who needs more power that is more reliable than what can be supplied by a central grid. Um, and essential grids have inherent limitations on how reliable they can be because they're stringing wires across the countryside. So that's the future of microgrids, and and uh, you're really see, we're starting to see some real activity here in the U.S. for these reasons. So I like to, I like to talk about you know sort of the big picture here of how do we get to the smart grid? You know, here in Boulder we're the um, we're supposed to be the uh, first smart grid city. Uh, and it was a big splashy demonstration project several years ago. Um, and uh, it went way over budget and it really, it didn't, it was kind of a failure, but the, one of the lessons we learned there, uh, well, two lessons, one's kind of silly, but um, um, the, the utility really felt it important to have a dedicated fiber line because they for security reasons. Um, and, and a central grid is, is is really a, a prime target for hackers uh, and cyber crime and 
uh, et cetera, cyber terrorism. So, uh, so they wanted a, a, a dedicated fiber line, and and uh, and that, so that's that, that's a legitimate and a lesson learned that yeah yeah if you're good, if you're a central utility um, reliability and uh, security excuse me is critically important reliability also but security is the point I wanted to make there so they so they wanted a dedicated underground fiber line. The other lesson learned, so, which is the silly one, is that you know that we're we're at a town called Boulder, the foot of the Rocky Mountains. Who would have expected we had rocky soil? So it was very expensive to put in this uh, underground dedicated fiber line. That was one of the problems. But um, on the other hand, if you want, it's really inappropriate to think of um, to to expect utility companies to be really innovative. And, and I don't mean that as a, a criticism of utilities. Their job is to keep a very large, very complicated system up and running. Uh, and you just don't experiment on big, large systems that people are really relying on. So, and, and, then, and they have the regulatory structure, et cetera. So for them to do anything innovative is, is just, it's not their job. Uh, their job is to keep the pet lights on. And if you want to do something innovative, it just makes sense to start to do it small scale first. So these microgrids that we've, I've been talking about that were developed on islands and remote areas, some of them have some really innovative um, um, P as aspects to them. Innovative metering that's being done by companies like Spark Meter and others, um, and also um, innovative load management approaches. So some of those Alaskan villages I mentioned where they run just on um, variable renewables and load management, some of them have a, a wireless grid, uh, I mean a, a wireless network um, that is varying power to individual appliances in individual in, in homes uh, real time. So as the wind's going up and down, the power to these storage heaters um, is going up and down in real time over a wireless network. That's the smart grid. And it's happening in remote Eskimo villages in Western Alaska that are, um, uh, I don't know, I think that's very um, inspiring. Uh, and they're demonstrating that you can actually do renewables at very high uh, penetration levels, much higher than, than what central grids can do uh, because it's just easier to manage things in, in a small scale. Uh, so those are the real smart grids, and uh, and we think that's the future. That's the how we get to high penetrations of renewables, and and a really smart grid is through, is through microgrids leading the way like that. Um, so I couldn't I couldn't have a con uh, a presentation like this today and talking about the future without mentioning how the future the future is really going to change now because of COVID, uh, and and so how is that going to affect us uh, um, in the microgrid world. And, and I think it's going to force us to do some things that we should be doing anyway. One of them is relying more on local expertise. So it's just not a sustainable development model to rely on flying in Western experts. We're, we're too expensive, for one. There aren't enough of us. The scale of the problem is so huge that the only way to make this happen is for local people to do most of the work. Uh, and and there's, a, there's another reason, very important reason as well, which is every place is different. Who should manage the system is a, is a cultural, there's social and cultural issues there and they're different in different places. And I love going traveling or used to, and uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, but, but it, it, I'll never really understand the local so, social and cultural context and who's important and who's appropriate to manage the systems. The local people understand that. They need to be the ones developing the systems. And so our role isn't to engineer the systems and design the systems, et cetera. It should be training. Uh, and so, and we've always done a lot of training. Um, and But now we're going to start doing more remote training, which um, is just a lot more efficient uh, and less costly and can, can um, reach a lot more people. Uh, so the, in some sense, this code's creating all kinds of problems, but it's in these two respects, it's forcing us to do something we should we should be doing anyway. Um, and another thing I, I, I have to talk about, um, in many years ago, I think like 2004, USAID uh, paid us to create a, a web app as part of the uh, President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief back in like 2004. 
so we created this web app called tools.poweringhealth.org and it's and it, it it got used quite a bit in that program and it's and we've kept it up um, and we've even um, enhanced it a little bit over the years a little bit uh, but now we've got just in the last couple of weeks the world bank has has uh, got engaged with us and i'm spending half my time now um fit, uh, improving this for covid clinics that the, the world bank and other groups like usaid want to um, start uh, deploying in, a, in a, on a large scale in response to the COVID crisis. So um, I think that was my last slide. I, I would be amiss, remiss not to mention our eighth annual Homer International Microgrid Conference. We've been doing this eight years in a row now, but this year because of COVID, we're going to do it in, instead of doing it in Barcelona, where we kind of really wanted to do that. Um, instead of that, we are going to do it 100% virtual. It'll be a series of webinars in the autumn, so stay tuned for that. And now I'll turn it over to back over to Marilyn uh, to read off some questions because I, I gather we've gotten quite a few questions. Thanks, Peter. Um, okay, so um, actually, before we go to the questions, um, I'm I've been monitoring them over here, and. Um, we always do when we do these, if we love it, that you ask us a lot of questions about Homer. And um, I just want to say that a um, couple of things. One is we have um, we have a free trial that's 21 days. You can try that. We have a great support team, support at homerenergy.com. We have a sales team and we also have people to um, help you with your modeling. You know, if you're if you're not sure that you're ready to dive in and learn Homer. So um, anyway, with that, I want to go ahead and go to the to the questions. Um, okay, so let's see, so many questions, and now they're coming in fast. Um, Peter, can you talk about um, electric vehicles and um, how those are going to relate to microgrids in the grid connected world? Uh, well, there's a couple of ways. The, the um, most immediate way is that electric vehicles make a, um, in some ways, they're a perfect controllable load. Uh, so oftentimes we, when we talk about control loads, we talk about water pumping or, or heating. Um, and, and by that, I mean it's, it's a load that needs to be served, but you have some flexibility about when to serve it. So if you plug in your vehicle in, in the evening, you don't, you don't want it coming on during the peak periods, and it can come in and, and fill the valleys, <clears throat> fill the valleys in the app in the in, in the middle of the night. Um, so it can it can make the whole power system more efficient if it's if it's properly controlled. Uh, and that's just one way. That's just charging. Uh, people are often talking about V2G, vehicle to grid or vehicle to home, um, where you, the vehicle is sort of an emergency supply for the grid, um, either um, helping it reduce its peak loads or um, um, providing spinning reserve in case of in case of an outage or something, or backup power. Um, that's still sort of experimental. There's a lot of concern about battery warranties, et cetera. Um, uh, but there's a lot of interest in that, and I think that I think properly managed that has a lot of potential as well. Um, the, um, I sort of like the idea of, I call it the Jakarta car, just because it sounds good, but in developing countries, uh, uh, you have a really robust electric vehicle, doesn't necessarily even have to have a very high top speed because in most developing countries, you, you're in the cities, you're not going to, you're not going to go very fast anyway. Um, and it's, maybe it's a hybrid, uh, plug-in hybrid, and uh, it's, it's a backup power for the, for the house because uh, in places, many places in the developing world, the central utility is just providing very unreliable power and people, if they can afford it, have a backup power system. And so you, your car could actually be the backup um, power if it was a, you'd have to be a hybrid, a plug-in plug hybrid. Um, so so that's just one of my pet ideas. But the main one is that it's a very, it's a very controllable load and, and it, it can make the load shape of the utility flatter and more efficient. And it can provide spinning reserve, if, um, um, just as as load management. So I, I think it has a lot of potential. It's, it's still new, but oh, and, and a, but a factoid that's really worth thinking about: the 
U.S. In terms of talking about the U.S. and Europe's probably pretty similar in Japan, um, is and China. Is the um, total power of the U.S. light vehicle fleet, just in terms of power, is ten times the power of the entire electric utility industry. So it, the electric vehicles don't need to be a huge um, market share, and I, I and we we have one, we love it, so we think they will take off well. But even if there's just a relatively small market share, they can have a big impact on the on the power on the utility system. Um, Peter, we're getting a lot of questions, interesting questions on definitions of microgrids, and um, I'm just going to read one of them out. Um, what, do, what do you think the best definition is? And specifically, does it require more than one generating source, or can a battery, PV plus a battery, be a microgrid? And are the, is the load part of the microgrid? Uh, so that's a great question, and people ask it all the time. And, and you know, when, when someone says, oh, that's a great question, it means it's a difficult question to answer. Um, um, because everybody has a different definition. I personally like a really simple definition. It is a system that can stand on its own. And uh, now you could say, well, North America stands on its own. But um, so the, the, I don't have a clear answer for at what size is it does it stop being a microgrid so you know we talk about island side island systems and you know working on small islands um and uh i had a fellow from ireland tell me well i live on a small I, I, you know ireland is a small island well I, I i wouldn't consider ireland a small island uh so it's so there's a bit of subjectivity to it but i think any it's a, a system that can stand on its own so yes a pv battery system with no backup generator and sure, and sure, the loads are part of the, are part of the system. Um, I would consider that a microgrid. Um, you'd have to do load um, so quite a bit of load management for you know the worst you know three days three cloudy days in a row kind of problem. Um, um, the some people the D Department of Energy had a definition that pre originally their definition precluded remote microgrids. They said it normally connected to the grid but capable of islanding. Um, now they're the expanded it because I think the remote microgrids are really important uh, part of it. The, in the development community, they call them mini grids, the, the smaller systems for you know remote villages, uh, small villages in in, like, in um, rural areas, for example. They they call them mini grids, which I which I think is unfortunate because they're smaller than in the U.S. We call you know a military base or a university campus might be 30 megawatts. We call that a microgrid. And then you have like a 20 kilowatt system and call that a mini grid. Well, micro should be smaller than mini, but it, in, in our world, it's not. That's unfortunate. And then some people start talking about pico grids and nano grids, and I think they're just confusing the issue. But um, any system, in my opinion, any system that can stand on its own, um, and it doesn't have to have multiple generators. Um, uh, you know, I just, you, I'm, I like a very broad definition personally, but everybody's got a different definition, which is a bit of a problem. It's true. How about what role do you see for direct current and microgrids? Well, there's a lot of interest in that these days. And um, uh, the ability to control direct current has really improved. Um, it, I mean, direct current, the reason Edison lost to Westinghouse is back then there wasn't any, a good way to change the voltage of, of a direct current um, circuit. Um, and so if you wanted high voltage to have transmission systems, you, you had to have AC. Um, um, and, and, and most, but these days, things are different. One, we, we do have good ways of changing the voltage of a DC circuit. Um, and two, a, a lot of the loads these days, all of your electronic loads are DC. Your LED lighting is DC. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in, in, in DC. Uh, I, I wouldn't say the appliance, the manufacturing of appliances is really ramped up. You know, most of DC appliances are developed for like recreational vehicles and they're not durable and efficient. They're, I mean, they're fine for recreational vehicles, but they're not really. Um, uh, and there's a big difference between 12 volt DC or, you know, your, your USB cable is five volts, your car battery, and, a lot, and there's a lot of things designed for 12 volts. Um, 
uh, that's really not the appropriate for large buildings. Uh, so then there's there's talk about so 300 and some volt DC circuits for you know warehouses and stuff. Uh, so it's it's new. It, there's a lot of potential for it. I don't think it'll completely replace AC personally. Um, and uh, it in it it uh, so it's it's an intriguing um, it's an intriguing technology with with potential. Um, circuit breakers are a little more difficult for DC. Uh, but it's, it has the potential to be more efficient in a lot of cases. So it's, uh, and especially in your really small systems, your solar home systems, if you can avoid the inverter altogether, if you're just doing lighting and cell phone charging, um, then DC is great. Uh, you, you don't, you just can avoid the inverter altogether, but that's for really small systems. Um, so it, it, it there's no, there's no one solution. Great, thank you. Um, so a couple questions about utilities, I think are interesting. Um, like the regulatory changes the utilities should be going toward and also the challenges that are facing, you know, utilities who want to be forward looking and, and really are trying to figure out how to decentralize their generation and grid infrastructure. Yeah. Well, that wasn't a question, but I'll I'll, I'll turn it into well, a question. <laughs> well, it, the the question is what what are the what what to do? What what are yeah what are their challenges if they want to do this and yeah. what how could the regulatory system support this? Right. Well, you, you know that that is a big question. That is, um and it's a very controversial one. Uh, and there's several aspects to it. Uh, one is there's just simply a financial issue, which is um. Distributed power means people producing their own power means they're buying less power from the utility company. So that's if so um, at, a, at a very high level, utilities need to move away from revenue that's based on just volumetric sales, kilowatt hour sales, because the kilowatt is because um, you know electric vehicles might cha uh, change this because they'll you will start they'll start selling more kilowatt hours. But um, that's a that's a financial challenge for them. Um, there's regular there's a whole range of regulatory issues like like microgrids are sort of inhibited in some states because you can't cross a right of way. As soon as you cross a right of way, you're you're a regulated utility. So can you sell power to your neighbor? Well, it, it, that's that's a whole regulatory issue. Um, then there's the sort of technical regulatory issue of maintaining grid stability which I think is a totally solvable problem, but it, it, it means aggressive use of information control and communication technology, which has improved dramatically. I mean, the technology is there, but it's a software and management challenge, which I think is solvable, but it's it's totally new kind of challenge for them. For them. Um, so there's a million aspects to this. Uh, and, um, you know, I was in California in the, in the um, late 80s and early 90s well late 80s um when they were starting to talk about deregulation and which is a misnomer it's it, there'll always be regulation but regulatory change um and and I, I could just see this train wreck coming and and it was you know and it's been popularized as the enron scandal because the enron was the company that really took advantage of really poorly thought out regulations uh, so if you do it wrong, it's a disaster. So they're very so that's why it's it's hard and and they have to be careful, which means it's slow. Um, uh, I mean, one way to think about it is these these um, um, disasters like Sandy and the wildfires, et cetera, are making people realize are making people treat electricity as a as a public good, as a as a as a necessity. Um, not not as just a commodity that you you can buy if you want, but you don't have to buy it if you don't want it. Uh, no, it's it's really considered a social a socially require a, a human right, if you will. Um, and and so that's that's a different mindset that requires a different thought process about how to regulate it. It's um, hugely controversial. I, you know that could be a that could be more than one hour all okay. by itself. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can talk more about that in in the autumn at the um, international sure. microgrid. We, we will be yes. Yeah.
<laughs> so um, how about, do you see any trend toward productized microgrids? I know you and I have talked about this before. Do you know of anyone working on that or? Yes, absolutely. Um, especially for the smaller ones. I mean, and that is the future for, for smaller microgrids. You know, the lar larger system, the, the one, one a metaphor might be Lego blocks, you know, where um, uh, for larger systems, but the smaller systems, they really should be productized. And there are companies doing it. At our last conference, we had a presentation by Box Power. That's, that's what they're doing. And I know um, I, I've had con just last week conversations with the World Bank who, who they want these containerized systems that they can just ship out as part of this COVID response. Um, it, 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 you, you can just do things cheaper, faster um, if you have container if you containerize them. And, just, and so then the installation becomes a lot simpler uh, and, uh, and you can mass produce them. It's the, you know, in, as opposed to the economies of scale building bigger and bigger things if you have smaller things you can have economies of, of, of manufacturing uh, uh, you can mass produce them um, so that would be the goal for um, smaller systems L larger systems probably will always need at least some level of customization but if the if the building blocks are standardized so standardization is and standards are, are really important the building blocks are standardized that it's not exactly productization, but for the bigger systems, that's the direction that, that it, things are going, you know, in fits and starts, that's the direction they're going. Great, thank you. So uh, do you know of any microgrids that were built after Hurricane Sandy? I mean, just uh, uh, a lot of talk and, and so what do you know? Do you know of anything? Uh, I'd be... Off the top of my head, it'd be hard to give you specific examples. There's been a lot of activity. Um, it's developing these projects has been slow because they're new. Um, and um, so I'm a little unclear which ones are built and which ones are still in development stage. At Homer, we, we've traditionally been involved in the early stages of project development. Um, I do know of one that did get built and it was just a rich guy in the Catskills had a big, huge estate and wanted it, a big microgrid there. That's not the greatest example, but 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 actually there are quite a few examples of we, rich green guys, we, you know, the RGG market, rich green guys. Um, like Branson, we helped him build a, a um, rebuild his private island in the, in, the, in the British Virgin Islands after it's actually now been hit by two hurricanes. Um, and Marlon Brando has a microgrid in the Pacific. And New York State was aggressive about this, and same with Connecticut. And um, uh, um, But uh, we don't get involved in the actual construction, so I'm going to punt on that part of the question. Great. Okay, thank you. So we are we're coming to the end of the webinar here. We have hundreds of questions that I apologize we are not going to get to. Um, so I'm just going to pick one and end with that. Um, could you talk about, you know, with oil prices dropping, you know, you're an economist, um, how might this impact the microgrid market or will it? Uh, well, that's a fascinating question. The, the oil market is, right at the moment, is, 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 is a truly fascinating thing that's going on. Um, so obviously the, the, the economic benefit of saving diesel fuel is diminished if oil prices are low. Um, and there's a, but, but one of the things that we hear over and over again isn't just, I want to reduce the cost of, of fuel, but I want to un reduce the uncertainty of fuel prices because the volatility of fuel prices gets passed on to the customers and, the, and then the customers complain. So they love it when it goes down, but then it goes up and it, they hate the volatility. So that's one point, um, uh, and 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 then there's a paradox because, well, I've often worried that the more successful we are at reducing oil consumption, the the less the it 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 it, it changes the supply to demand balance. Oil prices go down, so then it looks like well we sh we shouldn't have done that because it wasn't necessary. Um, that argument has, is diminished because of climate change as a totally different reason to reduce oil consumption. 
But but what what's probably going to happen? I mean, we have the one of the other reasons oil prices have have, have been have have gone down. The main reason, of course, is the COVID thing. But but the increase in shale production in the U.S. Uh, and that's all getting shut down. That the, those shale producers, are, for the most part, are not um, profitable at these prices. So uh, you know, with a lag, because it's hard to shut down an oil well. Um, so supply will adapt over time. Actually, shale adapts faster than big oil reservoirs in terms of, um, so so the supply of oil is going to drop. Um, you, you know, there's, the oil market is one of the craziest markets out there. I, I think that's about the best I can say. <laughs> Great, thanks, Peter. Okay, well, I wish we could answer all your questions. Where I'm, I'm, I'm over here actually typing while you're talking and trying to help people out. Um, I want to, you know, reiterate that support at homerenergy.com is there for you. Um, also, want to let you know about next month's webinar. Product manager Steffi Clawiter is going to talk about the new electric vehicle features coming um, up in Homer Grid. We're going to release that in beta. I think early next week. Um, so that'll give you an, an inside look at the new charging modeling and the and what this can do for your systems. And thank you again for your attending. Again, reach out to sales, reach out to support. Um, we will record this webinar and we hope to see you again next month. We really appreciate your attention. <laughs>